Okay, welcome to the next lecture on web services. Today is kind of a milestone because this is the last lecture from the W3C style web services, and then we'll move on to something else. But before we do, uh, one last uh, traditional web services extension, let's say, and uh, that is uh, Beeple. Um, what we already know is SOAP for sending messages uh, among web services. We know Visible for describing interface of web services in a machine readable way. And we know UDDI, which is kind of a catalog of web services where we can uh, record um, entries about the web services and we can find our web services uh, in the registry. Um, <clears throat> so far, we have talked about basically two web services communicating or web services finding other web services and so on. Um, and today we are going to talk about business processes implemented using web services. So today will not be about two services communicating. It will be about multiple web services arranged or orchestrated into a, an actual business process. So we'll talk about um, a set of web services and how to describe how exactly they should exchange what kinds of messages and how the data can be transformed um, among or, or between the actual web services calls and so on. So we will talk about having a business process, having a set of web services implementing parts of that business process. And we'll talk about a specification which allows us to basically use the set of web services and the input business process to actually implement another web service implementing that business process. So the business process will have, of course, inputs and outputs, and it will use uh, existing web services to do something. Um, so far, we have described communication of two web services. Today will be about multiple web services. Uh, when two web services communicated, it was either a request response exchange or one service sending a message to another service. Um, so that is part of what we will utilize today. But uh, we will talk about uh, Beeple, which is the specification for implementing business processes on top of existing web services. Um, the, um, when we talk about basically how a set of web services communicate, uh, we can uh, see that from two points of view. Uh, one is what we will talk about today, and that is web services orchestration, which means that we will use a set of existing web services. We will define precisely how they communicate, in what order, and how the data flows between or among the web services. Uh, and we will use a specification for that called uh, Beeple. So that's called orchestration. We have, um, we are the owners of the business process and we determine uh, the sequence and the set of web services that we will call. There is another term, web services choreography. Uh, this is out of scope of our course, uh, but it also deals with having a set of web services and uh, seeing how they communicate. Uh, but the use case here is different here. Uh, we do not have any particular point of view. We are not the owners of a process. Uh, in choreography, we cannot execute the process, whereas in orchestration, we will execute the actual process. Uh, and um, in choreography, there is that's like a high level overview of the set of web services and which services communicate with which. Uh, but it is not an executable business process. There is a standardized language to describe the choreography, but uh, we won't be talking about that one. We will be talking about Beeple, which is the language for specification of an executable business process. It's a web standard published by Oasis. Uh, the last version, 2.0, is from 2007. So here, it is similar to other W3C style web services, uh, which means that uh, the specifications were done, well, in this case, 15 years ago about, and uh, then 
probably everyone was satisfied with the status and it didn't evolve anymore. But Beeple is actually used in enterprise environments. And of course, since this is a W3C style web services uh, technology, it is based on XML, it is based on Wizzle. Um, the interesting thing here is that it is based on Wizzle 1.1. Wizzle 2.0 is not supported by Beeple, so we will be talking about Wizzle uh, again today, but uh, specifically Wizzle 1.1. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> the specification basically tells us that the business process will be described in two parts. We'll have the Wizzle file because the executable business process will be a web service again, so it will be described by a Wizzle. It will be slightly extended, and I'll show you how. Um, but that only basically describes the interface of the business process. So how to call it and what can we uh, expect um, to get from the business process. But then we need uh, the second part, which is the Beeple script. That one will describe what the actual process will do uh, and what other web services it will call and how, how it will process uh, the inputs and outputs. An example of such a business process can be a purchase order. Uh, so this business process will be a web service. It will accept a purchase order. It will do something and uh, it will return a, an invoice to the client. So from this point of view, it is just a regular web service to the client. However, internally, it will utilize other web services. It will check some credit card information, process of payment, calculate the price, and so on. And those individual functionalities will be implemented by um, individual web services, and the process will connect those in the order required, and it will um, facilitate uh, the data exchange among those web services. Uh, before actually the process ends with sending the invoice back to the client. Um, the process itself will be an abstract web service. Abstract meaning um, back when we talked about Wizzle, uh, we split uh, the constructs in Wizzle into the abstract web service definition. Those were the XML schema types, uh, messages, operations, and the port type. And uh, then into concrete definition, such as binding and the endpoint and so on. So the specific part uh, is going to be missing here. Uh, it will be added, of course, because we will be able to execute the process in the end, but it will be added by um, something that will deploy the business process. The business process itself will only contain the abstract part of, uh, of Wizzle. Um, Right, so uh, let's have a look at what we need to do with uh, Wizzle um, in the first part um, to, to be able to implement the uh, business process. So what we will have here is the purchase order process. It will have a port type because it will be described by Wizzle and there will be a send purchase order operation. So now we are talking about the traditional Wizzle the operation will have two messages. The client will send a purchase order message and, and they will receive the invoice message in return. Um, the whistle is restricted because it will not contain the binding and the endpoint part. It will just contain the abstract part. Uh, technically, it will look something like this. I presume you already uh, are familiar with this. So it will be whistle 1.1. Uh, with a port type, with the operation, with input and output, those connect to messages that are also defined in the Wizzle file, those connect to XML schema uh, types. So this is uh, uh, basically, uh, we know everything about, uh, about this. Uh, there will be an external web service that will be used by the business process. The external web service will be a credit card web service, and it will have a credit card port type with two operations, check credit card and process payment. Again, described by a traditional Wizzle file running somewhere. Uh, and we will 
want to reuse this web service in our business process. Here we'll have our purchase order process. Again, it will have a port type, but this port type is not the one facing the client. It is not the one receiving purchase orders and sending invoices. This one is um, a new port type uh, intended for communication with the external service. So the external service has a check credit card operation and process payment operation. Here we'll have a confirmed credit card operation calling this uh, credit card service operation and confirmed payment operation calling this credit card service operation. So they will exchange messages like this. This is our process. This is the external pre-existing service. Um, and they will exchange messages in their individual operations. When we have this communication established, we need to uh, indicate so in the whistle file of the business process. And we will indicate that uh, by describing a so-called partner link type. That is something new in Beeple uh, that belongs in, uh, in Whistle as a Whistle extension, um, a partner link type. There are actually two types of partner link types. One uh, serves for indication that uh, the business process will uh, use an external web service. And in that case, um, the partner link type has two participants, the process and the web service. Another partner link type is for uh, the business process and its client. And that one has only one participant and that is the process. The partner link type then characterizes the communication between a process and a web service or a process and its client. Here, let's have a look at the whistle files um, that um, describe the individual services. So here, we have the external pre-existing credit card service. So there is nothing new. That's just a traditional whistle. So we have a port type and two operations. So we have the port type and the two operations. We have the check credit card operation and the process payment operation described in whistle with inputs and outputs. So nothing new here. That's the standard definition of the external service. Uh, note one thing here though, um, the namespace here, the namespace used for the credit card service is CC. We will see this one used once more um, here. This is uh, the whistle file describing the purchase order business process. That's uh, here we have something new because the business process had a port type which served for communication with the client. So the client could send the purchase order and receive the invoice. That was described in the port type facing the client. But here we'll add another port type for receiving messages from the external web service. So this is a credit card callback port type and it has again two operations, but those operations only have inputs. Those inputs match the outputs of the credit card service. And uh, they match also the definition, of course, of, of the messages sent by the service. That's why I um, noted the CC namespace. It is used here uh, because actually the credit card services whistle file will be imported into the business processes whistle file. And therefore, uh, the new post type with the operations receiving uh, data from the external services, um, they directly reuse uh, the messages defined in the other services uh, whistle file. Um, so uh, the, the types here or the messages here actually match. But this is still a traditional whistle file. Okay, we have one more post type defined here for receiving data from external service. That's fine. Uh, but uh, we need to talk about the partner link types, which we haven't seen technically yet. Um, it is an extension element for Whistle. Uh, and uh, basically, as every element in Whistle, it will be named. Uh, that's not that important. Uh, but it will have uh, two, one or two uh, role uh, sub elements, uh, depending on the partner link type. So when it is a partner link type connecting the business process and the external web service. 
there will be two role elements. If it is the partner link type uh, specifying basically the connection of the business process to a client, there will be only one role uh, sub element. The role will be named and it will point to the port type uh, of that partner link type. So the partner link type goes from one port type to another port type. Technically, it will look like this. This is the case for the external credit card service and the business process. So that's the case where the partner link type contains two roles. And we can see it here. So this is a partner link type called credit card link type because it connects to a credit card service. Um, and uh, one role will be credit card service uh, and the second role will be credit card client. The credit card client we'll assume will be the business process. The credit card service will be the external service. And uh, we also link to the uh, port types uh, respectively. So the credit card service port type is the one from the credit card services whistle file. And the credit card client role uh, or the, the port type will be the callback port type. That's the new port type that we created in our business process whistle so that it can receive data from the external web service. We'll add one more partner link type for the client of the business process. So here we'll have a uh, purchase order uh, link type, and that's the one that the client uses to communicate with the business process. Therefore, there is just one role uh, element uh, pointing to the pur purchase order port type of that business process whistle. So like this, we have our partner link types added to um, the whistle file of the business process. That's it. That's all we need to do on the level of whistle. Now we need to switch to the second part of uh, Beeple, and that is the definition of the process itself. So now we somehow know which external services will be reused or can be reused actually, um, and uh, how the client can communicate with the process. And now it is time to define the process itself. The definition is uh, yet another XML file uh, using uh, the Beeple XML language. And um, the XML file looks like this. It, it, it has a root element process with the correct namespace, of course. And there are four main parts in, in the process. The first part, um, defines the partner links. So those are uh, based on the partner link types from, uh, from Whistler. Uh, the second part contains variables. Those are the classic named variables that will contain some data that uh, we can change or receive from a web service or send to a web service or a client. So variables for uh, holding data. Uh, then when something goes wrong, there can be a fault handler but fault handlers, handlers are out of scope of uh, today's lecture. So you can ignore those. And then the main part is the main activity. That is what the process actually will do. We'll start with the partner links. So here we need to specify in the process which partner link types are actually used by the process and how. So here we'll have a partner link named, of course, and it will point to a partner link type from the whistle file. And um, it will say which role is the role of the business process and which role is the role of the external service, the partner. So my role and my role is the role of the business process is the credit card client role and the partner role here is the credit card service role. So those are the roles defined in the partner link type in the whistle file. And here we just indicate that those will be used by this, uh, by this process. The same goes for the partner link uh, for the client calling the process. So here we have the purchase order request link um, pointing to the partner link type. And here we have just the my role. That's the role of the, of the business process. And um, that's the one used by clients. Okay, so that's it for the partner links. Then uh, the variable definitions. Uh, variables are regular named variables. So we have the variable section, variable element with the name of the variable. And uh, the important part here is that 
a variable can have three different types. It can have a message type, then it contains a message from the whistle point of view. So that's uh, the whistle message with its parts and the parts uh, contain some XML data. So that's what a variable can, can hold, but it can also hold uh, an XML element. That's something else than a whistle message. And it can also hold anything defined or compliant with an XML schema type. So those are three different things that the variables can contain. Uh, and um, those types of things need to be compatible in order to pass a value from one variable to another, for instance. Um, so it can be a message, it can be an element, or it can be anything compliant with an XML schema type. Uh, the difference is in the attribute here. When you specify message type, then it points to a message. When you specify element, then you point to a specific element. And when you uh, use type, you point to an XML schema type. So three things that um, a variable can hold here. And this brings us basically to the main activity. So now we know which services we will use. We know where we will store our data in the process. And we can finally get to what the process will do. Uh, and there are four main types of activities. We'll talk about uh, messaging and structured uh, activities. Uh, the other two will be out of scope for us. Um, so uh, messaging activities are activities that actually send or receive a message, either from a client or to a client or from or to an external web service. Um, we'll start with the invoke activity. Invoke activity actually calls an external web service. And what we need to call an external web service? Well, the activity is named, of course, because everything is named. Um, the activity calls a service described in a partner link. So there needs to be the partner link. And the partner link points to the partner link type, which points to um, um, actually, there is the, the role in the partner link type identified in the partner links, uh, and the role points to a port type, and the port type contains operations. And we need to choose one uh, that we will use to on, on the external web service. So we point to the partner link, and we point to the operation that we all want to call. And then all that is left is to specify what data we want to send to the service and where we want to store the results of that call. Those are variables that we have already defined. So we have the input variable, that is the data that is being sent to the external service. And we have the output variable. That's the place where the data from the external service will be stored. Um, so that's the invoke activity. We can send or call an external service with data and receive, um, receive data from the service. So that is what is used to call external web services. But we also need some activities used to communicate with our clients. And uh, those are receive. The receive activity actually waits for the client to send something, send a request to the business process. So again, it is named. It points to the partner link and the operation uh, that uh, the client will use. And it points to a variable where the data from the client, from the request, will be stored. Uh, there is one additional uh, attribute here, create instance. This one says that once a message is received using this activity, an instance of the entire process is being created. So um, yeah, basically, it says this is the start of the process. So here, the process will wait until a message is received. And when it is received, it is received using this activity. Um, then the business process does something. And in the end, it will reply to the client. For that, we have the reply activity, again named, again pointing at a partner link and an operation. And the variable here contains the data that will be returned to the client. So now, we are able to create a business process that receives a message from a client, calls an external web service, receives data from the external web service, and returns data to the client. 
So if we were to implement a pass through business process, we already know how to do that. There will be a receive, then there will be an invoke, and then there will be a reply with the data uh, passed through the appropriate variables. But that is, of course, not that interesting. Uh, we want to be able to, to create more interesting business processes than uh, just pass through. Um, yeah, this is just to note that uh, the receive and reply activities are actually pairs. So for every receive, you need to have a reply. And if it would happen that you have multiple pairs of receive reply, you can distinguish those using the message exchange attribute. Uh, Right, but let's have a look at what we can actually do within uh, the process uh, between the message exchanges. Uh, a key activity is the assign activity. And the assign activity allows us to basically copy data from one place to another. That can be from one variable to another. We can use this again for the path through use case, but uh, the assign activity can be more interesting than that. Uh, it can uh, have XPath and XSLT um, expressions. So you can actually take what is in that variable, that can be an entire message or an XML element with, uh, with the interesting data, and you can extract parts of that using XPath, or you can transform the message using XSLT. And there you can do lots of things, right? So you do something and you store the result uh, of the XPath uh, query or the XSLT transformation uh, in another variable. So like this, you can process the data that you get from the client or the external services. Right, <clears throat> so let's now combine the activities that we already have into uh, a sequence. So there is the sequence activity, which does just that. It calls the individual activities in the sequence element in that sequence, one by one. Um, it always waits for the activity to finish and then it calls another activity. So uh, the sequence can look like this. We can receive something from a client, then we can use the assign and copy uh, activity to actually do something, extract something, for instance, credit card information, uh, store it in a var variable and invoke an external service, pass the data in that variable, receive the data, store it in another variable. Again, use assign to do something to the received data and uh, use reply to actually send the data back to the client. Okay, so like this, we can combine activities into a sequence, uh, but that uh, might not be efficient in every use case. We are on the web. And when we call multiple web services, we can call them also not in a sequence, but in parallel, because they should be independent of each other. And that is what the flow activity is for. So flow, again, has a set of individual activities, but using flow, those activities can be executed in parallel and they do not wait for each other. So here in the flow, we have a sequence, uh, and two invokes. So uh, here, these two invokes need to be in a sequence, but the sequence itself is independent from the other two invokes, and all the three uh, things can be executed in parallel. So that is what flow does. Uh, and whenever uh, we actually uh, have a parallel execution, there might be some synchronization issues. And there is support for synchronization in flow in Beeple in form of links. Uh, so in a flow, you can define a link. It is just a named thing um, that basically is a synchronization primitive. So for flow, you define a link. It doesn't do anything by itself, but it can be used uh, as a source. So here we have an invoke, which serves as a source to a link. A link will also serve as a target in other activities. And the rule is that uh, an activity that has a link in a target can begin execution only after another activity that had that link in a source has finished. 
So here, this invoke is a source to a price to payment link. And when it finishes, the activities that have the price to payment link as a target can start execution. So it is a synchronization primitive. Um, like this, uh, we have a simple case where the activity needs to finish and then uh, the, the source, uh, the link here is activated or fulfilled or something. Uh, the condition might be a bit uh, more complex. There can be a transition condition, which, uh, can, which allows us to, to state what additional condition needs to be fulfilled so that the, um, the link is, uh, is activated. Here, we have two links and each has a different transition condition. So it is not just that this activity finishes, but it is also that this condition needs to be satisfied. Uh, so yeah, uh, the conditions here can be more complex. And let's have a look at the target. So here we have a process payment invoke, which has the price to payment link as a target, which means that it can pro uh, start processing only after uh, this first invoke, which had this link as a source, uh, finished. And also with targets, we can have a join condition specifying a more complex rule uh, when actually this, uh, this activity can start execution. Uh, the default is that when you have multiple target links, um, you can start executing when one of those uh, actually is activated. Uh, but with the joint condition, you can specify another, uh, another rule for that. For instance, that both of those need to be activated for, for, this, uh, for this activity to start. Right. Um, then uh, in your business process, uh, you can have uh, the classic if then else workflow. So you can uh, specify a condition and when this condition is meant, uh, met, uh, you do something. Then you can have else if with another condition and you, have, you can have else with, uh, uh, well, you know what else means, right? So uh, if then else support, and there is also a while a cycle support. So you have a while, the condition, and then you have an activity which may um, contain uh, some, some activity that edits the counter variable uh, that you check here. So a classic while cycle. Um, then there is a special scope component that works somehow like, um, well, it, it doesn't do much, but it uh, limits the scope for, or creates a new scope for uh, local partner links, variables, and activities. So it basically creates a sub process. Um, and it can be used in a for each um, construct. So here, we have a for each, we can choose whether it should be parallel or not. Uh, and uh, we specify a counter name and then uh, start value and uh, final value. And we can see the scope. And within that scope, there is the process that gets done for each um, uh, of, uh, of, uh, <clears throat> of um, the numbers between the start value and the final value of that counter variable. Right, so that was very quick today. We are finished already with the lecture. This is what we will try in the tutorial. Of course, as with every technology, it is more important to play with it in the, in the tutorial than uh, see the lecture about it. Um, Beeple is more complex than just what we have seen. Uh, however, uh, the basics are here. We will try the basics. Uh, the things that we haven't covered um, are fault handling, event handling, terminating processes in the middle, um, compensations. So when, when a process does something and then it needs to terminate in the middle, it might need to undo the stuff that it did uh, using a compensation. So there is basically support for kind of transactions. Um, yeah, and uh, then some advanced, advanced things which we won't get into. So any questions regarding people? Any questions regarding something else? Yep. Yep. 
Yeah. Uh, so actually, you don't redefine it. Um, let me go back to uh, the, the image here. Um, yeah. Uh, so this is your pre-existing service. And it has a whistle file defining the service. What you do in the whistle file of the business process is that you import that one. So you include it. Uh, the business process needs to know that whistle file because it contains definitions of the types and operations and messages and all that. But you do not copy the content, you import that external whistle file. And then you reuse those definitions in, in the whistle file of the business process. Okay, any other question? If not, then I'll see you tomorrow uh, in the tutorial. Uh, for the tutorial, you'll need um, Apache ODE, which is actually the execution uh, engine that will receive the definition of the business process and will create uh, the instance that you can call. Um, yep. So that's it. Uh, it's not uh, something major. If you would be, however, interested in um, creating the business process file um, in a little bit more sophisticated way than in a notepad, uh, you can try um, actually installing a Beeple extension into Eclipse. However, um, since the Beeple technology is a, a bit dated already, um there are some issues they they are explained in the tutorial slides i moved those slides to the end because um yeah it's a bit iffy but i have tried uh installing that extension into uh, the latest version of eclipse and in the end i succeeded basically the problem is that uh, once you add uh, the extension there is a bug in the extension uh, it's a stupid bug because uh, in one of the jar files, which are actually zip files, um, there is an XML file with an invalid comment syntax. So when you fix that, it will work, but it won't work out of the box. Um, so you can either fix that manually or you can use one of my provided jar files where I fixed that for you, but you need to basically install the extension into Eclipse then you need to close Eclipse, you need to delete the faulty jar file, you need to run Eclipse so that it notices that something is missing, you need to close Eclipse, you need to insert the jar file from me, run Eclipse, and then you can create your Beeple project. And the advantage is that you will have a WSDL validator there, you will have a graphical interface for creating the business process. So that might be, um, better than uh, doing um, all that in uh, a textual way uh, because the typical problems that uh, you can uh, run into in Beeple are that you uh, basically break the whistle file, you do not uh, correctly import something or you do not uh, use the namespaces in a correct way. Other than that, um, it is quite simple. So this is up to you. Uh, if you want to come prepared uh, to, to the tutorial, you can try to do that ahead of time. We will try to create the business processes by hand, basically, in a text editor uh, or XML editor. Uh, but there is a better way if you want to try that out.